equal to itself. All right, so now that we've looked at um, World War II, can we look at what happened uh, during the post-war period? Okay, so this would constitute the short-term uh, reasons for the outbreak of the Cold War. Right. So just some background on uh, post-war competition. Okay, essentially, uh, you know, World War II, as we know, devastated Europe, and uh, there was tremendous uh, destruction. Okay, industrial output was about half it was before the start of the war. Also, there was displacement of people, so a lot of people were homeless. Okay, uh, really, uh, World War Two basically was the worst uh, war that you know in the history of the world. Okay, in terms of the number of people affected, and Europe was particularly devastated because so much of the war happened in Europe, and therefore Europe needed some rebuilding, and um, essentially. European countries didn't have the financial means to begin reconstruction simply because they were so devastated. A lot of people were displaced. They, they just didn't have the financial means to uh, recover uh, from the damage caused by the war. And therefore, they couldn't rely on themselves and therefore needed external help okay, in order for them to reconstruct itself. And uh, there was also a political vacuum. Okay, Basically, a vacuum is... Uh, place where there's essentially nothing in there. So there was a political vacuum uh, in Europe itself and um, because governments in Germany, in the Nazi government in Germany and also the fascist government in Italy had collapsed, uh, Britain and France were no longer major global decision makers because they themselves were devastated as a result of World War Two, and you know could no longer be um, the powers they were before the war. And uh, the political vacuum essentially paved the way for both the USA and the Soviet Union to step in. Essentially, there was a vacuum over there. So when uh, there's a vacuum, someone or something needs to fill that vacuum. And uh, countries like the USA and the Soviet Union were strong enough to fill that gap okay, left by World War Two, And this resulted in competition for the leading role in the reconstruction. Remember, they needed help uh, externally, and, and therefore these two superpowers who basically emerged from uh, World War II as the two strongest uh, countries in the world had to compete for the leading role in reconstruction, uh, reconstruction in Europe in particular. And therefore both wanted to increase their political and economic influence uh, in Europe itself. They saw this as an opportunity to increase their influence okay, because they were strong and Europe was weak and it was a good chance for them to increase their own influence in Europe. Okay, And uh, as a result of uh, World War Two, as I said, both the USA and the USSR basically rose up and became superpowers. Um, the USA emerged from World War Two, an economic and military superpower. Okay, by far the strongest country uh, in the world okay, in terms of its uh, economy, in terms of uh, the resources that, that uh, it had. Uh, and also um, the fact that Germany was defeated. Remember during World War II they fought a common enemy. Now uh, the common enemy had been defeated and there was no common cause for both the USA and the USSR to fight for. And therefore from allies they slowly found themselves becoming enemies during the Cold War. And this was due to their competing goals. For example, the USA, uh, when you know when we think about Europe itself, okay, the USA wanted to reconstruct Europe. Okay, want, uh, they wanted US, uh, the Europe, uh, European countries which were devastated by World War II to recover as quickly as possible. Uh, however, the USSR had different uh, priorities. They wanted to um, secure their own borders, so they wanted the prior prioritize their own security needs above the reconstruction of Europe. Uh, and also another difference was that uh, the USA feared the expansion of communist influence. Okay, um, however, the USSR feared the expansion of capitalism, actually. They feared a capitalist Europe. Okay, Europe that was so ideologically different from itself that uh, future conflicts may occur between these two blocks. Okay, and the USSR didn't want a situation like that. So USA feared communism, USSR feared capitalism. And therefore, each power 
was basically protecting their own, uh, its own political and economic interest, and therefore tensions and conflict looked inevitable during this period, simply because of these uh, strong competing goals, diametrically opposed com- uh, competing goals. Okay, and also um, there was uh, basically uh, a lot of misinterpretation of the actions. Okay, remember we looked at. Um, Mutual perceptions of hostile intentions. Okay, we're going to see how this uh, came about. Okay, uh, which uh, basically contributed to the outbreak of the Cold War. So, okay, first thing we um we look at Eastern Europe itself. Okay, uh, can we close this part? Okay, um, in Eastern Europe, Stalin basically brought Eastern Europe under its control, so that it could prevent attack from the West. All right, so um, if you look at uh, Eastern Europe over here, okay, it's over here, the Soviet Union is here, so it basically uh, wanted to increase its influence over here so that the West would find it more, if an attack came from the West, it wouldn't really come it had to go through this part, so like a buffer zone before it could get to the Soviet Union. So by having this uh, country, this area over here under um, its own control, basically it would help to uh, meet the Soviet Union's security needs. Okay. However, although um, Stalin saw control of Eastern Europe as something that was defensive in nature, uh, that was to serve its own security needs, the USA saw it as an aggressive policy, okay, trying to expand its own influence so that it could, you know, uh, have dominance over Europe. Okay, and um, also Soviet control of Eastern Europe was against the US pursuit of democracy in Europe. Remember, the USA wanted to uh, have free elections uh, across formerly, uh, uh, across uh, Territories formerly occupied by the Nazis, so the fact that the Soviet Union, you know, came in and took control was against the U.S. Uh, goal of uh, implementing free elections. And okay, um, also the fact that um, Soviet control was brought in seemed to uh, go against the I- uh, U.S. goal of economic reconstruction. So instead of letting um, the countries uh, uh, be reconstructed. Okay, the Soviet Union taking over these countries basically, uh, you know, having a different idea of how to construct the economies would go against the American uh, idea of economic reconstruction. Okay, um, secondly, we look at the containment policy. Okay, um, okay um, this policy was adopted essentially to uh, contain Soviet influence. So we're going to look at, firstly, Cannon's long telegram so remember uh george cannon over here yeah he wrote this long telegram which was very very influential uh in the american government and helped the american government make certain decisions with regard to how it dealt with the soviet union okay so essentially cannon uh who who spent a lot of time in the ussr uh stated that the ussr had aggressively tried to expand its sphere of influence in Europe. So uh, far from being uh, defensive, it was actually trying to be offensive, to expand its own sphere of influence. And uh, what Cannon uh, recommended was a vigilant containment policy. So instead of sitting back, relaxing, letting nature take its course, uh, Cannon suggested that the USA must be vigilant in containing Soviet expansion. Couldn't just sit back and relax, it had to actively, you know, uh, come up with ways to stop the Soviet Union from expanding its influence. Okay, and secondly, uh, shortly after Cannon's long telegram, okay, what you ha- what you had was Churchill's Winston Churchill, okay, the former British Prime Minister at this time, he uh, made a very famous speech. Okay, you see Truman over here, very famous speech uh, at Fulton, Missouri, in America, called the Iron Curtain speech and basically uh what churchill did uh, what churchill said during the iron curtain speech was uh that there was an increasing divide between western europe and eastern europe and the ussr so this is basically um illustrated by this map over here you see this white 
uh, line over here that is basically the uh, iron curtain that Churchill was uh, referring to and this basically is, uh, separated Europe into two competing blocks so the western block uh, over here and the eastern block over here okay and the iron curtain basically separating these two blocks an impact of uh, both the long telegram and the Iron Curtain speech was that it pushed uh, the USA into adopting a stronger, more active stance against the USSR. Okay, because of this divide and because of the fact that uh, the Soviet Union was perceived as being aggressive, um, it formed uh, this idea of containment basically formed the basis of the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan later on. And this later would increase tensions between the superpowers, which eventually led to the outbreak of the Cold War. Okay, so you must see this link, okay, this sequence of events. Okay, the um, uh, containment policy basically uh, pushed the USA into having this stronger uh, stance against the USSR, and which led the USS, uh, USA to take certain actions later on, which increased tensions, which then led to the Cold War. Okay, so always think about, uh, think in t terms of escalating tensions and increasing tensions between the two superpowers. Okay. So uh, we looked at the containment policy and how it affected the uh, U.S. Uh, actions against the Soviet Union. So firstly, um, we look at the Truman Doctrine. Okay, the Truman Doctrine speech. Essentially, Greece and Turkey. Okay, these two uh, countries. Uh, required economic and military aid uh, after the devastation of World War Two. Previously, they depended on the British, but because the British were so weak after World War Two, they couldn't provide the kind of support to both Greece and Turkey. And communist influences were also uh, seen as increasing uh, in the period after World War Two in these two countries. And again, remember the USA saw. Uh, uh, weak countries, uh, unstable countries, poor countries being more susceptible to communist influences. Yes, they saw exactly the same thing in Greece and Turkey. Okay, so basically what the Truman Doctrine speech did, okay, uh, Truman, Harry Truman, the president of the USA, basically made this speech which pledged uh, economic and military aid to countries that were seen as being uh, under being in danger of falling to totalitarianism but okay when he said totalitarianism uh, basically he actually meant communism okay and when we look at uh, the impact of the truman doctrine um what happened was that the usa pledged to support democracy and freedom not just uh in europe but it actually seemed to imply that uh you know they would do it across the globe okay and although um, Truman said that you know uh, the USA was supporting countries and ensuring that they do not fall under totalitarian rule, which is basically you know one uh, one government basically having total control over the people, total control over the country, he actually kind of meant communism. Okay, in that case, because uh, communism was also seen as a form of totalitarian rule. Where you know the government, the dictator takes control of the entire uh, country's uh, functions. Okay, so the Truman Doctrine speech uh, was made, and uh, help was uh, later uh, help was given to both Greece and Turkey. But not only this, uh, the Marshall Plan was an extension of the Truman Doctrine, and. What happened was that the USA committed itself to giving economic aid to not just Greece and Turkey, but also this aid was to reconstruct Europe as a whole and uh, Europe's economies okay, itself. So uh, what another name for the Marshall Plan was the European Recovery uh, Program. Okay, and basically it was for European recovery supplied by the United States of America. Okay, and why did um, the USA want to uh, implement this Marshall Plan? Of course, Marshall, the Marshall Plan was named after General George Marshall, and at the time he was the Secretary of State, like the Foreign Minister of uh, the USA. And basically, um, the Marshall Plan was put in place to uh, 
undermine the USSR's authority and because the Marshall Plan 8 was actually offered to not just the Western Allies but also to the USSR itself and its satellites. Okay, so and what so if you look at the map again, okay, the Marshall Plan wasn't just offered to those in blue, it was also offered to those in red. Okay, although the, those in red were seen as being uh you know, kind of like enemies, but they were actually also offered Marshall Plan 8. It's quite smart because um, after Marshall Plan was offered, the Marshall Plan 8 was offered to the USSR, okay, uh, what happened was that, um, okay, so by offering um, aid to the USSR and the satellites, uh, it presented the USSR with two options. Uh, if the USSR and the satellites were to accept Marshall Plan 8, they would be open to the USA's influence. However, if the USA, uh, USSR was to reject um, this aid, it would strain the relationship between the USSR and the satellites because the USSR would seem to be depriving the satellites of this help that was offered to the satellites. Of course, the satellites were in bad, a very, very bad state as well. Okay? And um, also, the Marshall Plan okay, was uh, uh, introduced with the belief that communist parties in Europe would gain popularity if Europe remained poor. Okay, so again, with the idea that uh, poor countries would be more susceptible to communist influence. And so, an economically strong Europe would see communism, the popularity of communism fall. Okay, and also a, a strong uh, Europe could serve as an export market, you know, basically a place where the USA could sell um, the goods that it produced. So uh, it was a win-win situation. Not only would communism be less appealing in a strong Europe, uh, a strong Europe could also uh, be a market for the USA to sell its goods to. So you know, it's just a win-win situation economically and politically speaking for the USA. So what were the results of the Marshall Plan? Okay, firstly, um, industries in participating nations were revived. So those uh, nations which took up Marshall Plan 8 uh, basically uh, managed to recover in time. And many European nations were also convinced that the USA was sincere in helping Europe. Okay, the fact that um, the USA was willing to extend its uh, helping hand to help Europe recover. However, the USSR, which had rejected Marshall Plan 8, to itself and to the satellites, um, basically appeared very selfish. Okay, the fact that you know, um, to secure its own borders, to serve its own selfish interests, they would basically uh, reject Marshall Plan Eight, which which could have been very very helpful to its satellites. So USSR looked very very selfish, very concerned only about itself. So basically, the impact of the Marshall Plan was uh, good, was in favor. Um, in, uh, at least from the perspective of the USA because it was successful in containing Soviet influence and it split Europe into two opposing economic blocks. Okay, so basically uh, you had Marshall Plan Europe and non-Marshall Plan Europe. So it was very, very clear political economic competition between the superpowers as a result of those uh, countries accepting Marshall, the Marshall Plan and those countries rejecting or being forced to reject the Marshall Plan 8. Okay, so again, if we look at the map, okay, it's again split into two very, very clear set, uh, blocks, okay. And how did the Soviet Union respond to US actions? Okay, so firstly, the um, Soviet Union created the Common Form, and uh, its aim was to unite um, the communist states in Eastern Europe. Okay, and uh, basically, it tried to tighten control, Soviet control over the satellite states. Um, so, for example, Soviet style communism was implemented, and trade was limited to the Common Form members. Okay, so again, if you look over here, since the USA was so successful in implementing its Marshall Plan 8, uh, causing countries which accepted Marshall Plan 8 to fall under uh, 
uh, influence of the, uh, the USA, the Soviet Union wanted to do exactly the same thing. So it wanted to tighten the control of its own bloc okay, and to compete with the USA trying to tighten control over you know, the Western bloc, for example. Okay, so, um, so that was you know, one of the things they did. And uh, about two years later, less than two years later, um, the Comic Con was formed. And uh, an extension from the Common Form, its aim was to coordinate the Common Form's members' economic policies, okay, under, of course, under the direction of the Soviet Union itself. However, um, the Soviet Union and its satellites had certain problems. So, and, for example, the Soviet economic recovery was slow, and therefore, Comic-Con could not match up to the Marshall Plan's economic aid. Okay, so the Soviet satellite state essentially uh, developed and recovered more slowly than those which accepted Marshall Plan aid. And uh, certain economic arrangements also benefited the USSR at, at the expense of um, the satellite states. Okay, for instance, the uh, Soviet Union could exploit the... Um, uh, resources uh, of its satellite states, for example, like Poland, okay, countries like that, uh, at the expense of these satellites to benefit itself. So, what was the impact of um, Soviet responses? Essentially, tensions over economic and political com competition increased simply because there were, there were very two very clear competing uh, political and economic blocks, okay, in Europe itself. So right now, you know, uh, we saw the USA trying to contain the Soviet Union. Soviet Union responding to uh, attempts to contain it, basically formed and and perpetuated or made more permanent. Okay, the divide in Europe between the Soviet bloc and the Western allies, the bloc of the Western allies. Okay, so right now we've looked at post-war competition. So the more short-term trigger events. Okay. And finally, we're going to look at the manifestations of the Cold War. So essentially, by this time, the Cold War had already begun. Two clear economic and political blocks were seen in Europe. Uh, we're going to look at how uh, these tensions manifested itself into actual situations. Okay. So first, we're going to look at the Berlin blockade. And as we remember, Germany uh, had been split into four parts. Okay, so some background. Um, uh, there was a Soviet-controlled part of Germany. Uh, if we look at the map again, it's over here. Okay, and it wasn't doing as well economically as those under the Western Allies. Okay, and Stalin uh, basically resented, he hated um the fact that the USA, Britain and France had a presence in West Berlin. So if you look again at the map over here, okay, the US, British and French presence were not limited to here. They also had a part in Berlin itself. So within the eastern zone, there was a western presence. Okay. And basically, Stalin really, really didn't like that at all. Okay, and he wanted to absorb West Berlin to get the British, the French, and the Americans out of this part. So that Berlin, instead of being split into uh, these um, four parts, okay, to be entirely yellow, entirely under the influence of the Soviet Union. Okay, so what did Stalin do to try to absorb West Berlin? Okay, essentially Stalin blocked passage from West Berlin from the US, British and French zones of occupation. Essentially, he made it more difficult from pe for people from here to get here, okay, within Berlin itself to get yeah, okay, blocked it out totally. Okay, that's what we mean by blockade. Okay, so we look over here. Okay, the bear, again representing the Soviet Union, basically encircled uh, the western part of Berlin. You see here the British flag, the American flag, the French flag, 
Okay, but over here you have this bear over here limiting access to West Berlin. Okay? And not only did he do that, he also cut electricity to West Berlin. So no electricity, no passage into West Berlin. So he just blocked it off, uh, essentially. Okay? And because of this... Uh, West Berlin started to starve, started to face a shortage of resources and found that, you know, found it more and more difficult to sustain itself. So how did West Berlin respond? Sorry, how did the Western Allies respond? Essentially, what they did was to implement this thing called the the airlift. Okay. Dudum, so basically our planes were flown over West Berlin. Okay, see these little children very very happy to see these planes because these planes would fly supplies into the western zone over here so if you look at the western zone it would have been here right western berlin so it would fly supplies few all the way here and would drop things in the western part of berlin okay to keep uh, the west berliners going so this is what we know as the Berlin airlift. So food and other necessities were flown in every day. Okay, and uh, this kept West Berlin from starving. And of course, Stalin couldn't shoot these planes down. These planes were simply there to drop supplies to keep people uh, uh, on their feet, keep them surviving. So if, and Stalin didn't want to risk shooting these planes down because if they shot these planes down, these harmless planes down, would have been seen as an act of war. And of course, at this time, uh, you know, they, Stalin really didn't uh, have the capacity to go to war against, you know, the Western Allies. So, uh, as a result, the airlift was successful. Stalin really couldn't do anything about the airlift. So, Stalin, you know, felt that ah, there's no point uh, continuing the blockade. So, he ended the blockade in May 1949, about a year after the blockade was first imposed. So, in a way, Stalin sort of, you know, seemed to have raised his hands up and said, okay, I'm not working, uh, I was in the wrong, I've lost. So it was a great victory for the USA and it embarrassed the Soviet Union who looked very, very uh, heartless, very evil for doing what they did. Okay, and it also showed the US was technologically more superior, the fact that it was able to fly in sufficient supplies to just keep West Berlin going. And so Stalin's actions were basically in vain. And Trizonia was formed. Okay, and okay. what do I mean by Trizonia? So if we look at uh, Germany, at first it was divided into four main zones. So you had uh, the British, the US and France over here, constituting West Germany. Soon, uh, they essentially, the th three parts over here formed, uh, came together and just formed one part. Okay, they came together and essentially split Germany, not into four zones, but just two zones. You had the eastern zone over here, which was under uh, communist, under Soviet con uh, influence. And then you had West Germany over here. They all come together as one. So essentially, it seems like two-thirds of um, uh, Germany was under um, capitalist and democratic influence. Okay, so you had West Germany and East Germany. Okay. Okay, so um that's the Berlin blockade. So very, very clear tensions, very very clear conflict of interest between um the superpowers, the USA and the USSR. Okay, not only that, uh, as a result of the Berlin blockade, uh there's an in an increasing militarization of the Cold War. And this came uh, as a result of the NATO and the Warsaw Pact. So what was the NATO? Basically, it was an alliance between the USA and the Western Allies. And they basically pledged to defend one another. So it was, kind of a, it was a military alliance, essentially. Pledging to defend one another in case of attack. And this was also in response to the Soviet military presence in Eastern Europe. Okay, a lot of uh, Soviet troops which... Uh, defeated the Nazis, uh, refused to move out of Eastern Europe. And of course, Stalin's uh, unreasonable actions, uh, you know, for example, uh, when we look at the Berlin blockade, uh, encouraged um, uh, the USS, 
the USA and its Western allies to be more cautious, to be stronger against, uh, you know, uh, communist expansion. Okay, and also um, you had the Warsaw Pact, and this was formed in response to the NATO, which was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So the USA and its Western allies. So the Soviet Union and its satellite states formed the Warsaw Pact, its own brand, its own military alliance. Okay, and similarly, they pledged to protect one another, and this essentially secured protection of the Soviet Union. Because if we look at the Iron Curtain over here, the Soviet Union formed a military alliance with all these countries over here, and this basically formed a buffer zone again for the Soviet Union to help keep the Soviet Union uh, safer okay, than it otherwise would be. What was the impact of this militarization of the Cold War? Of course, when you have uh, armies involved, when you have militarization involved, Cold War tensions would increase. Okay, so there was another indication of increasing by polarity. So it wasn't just uh, two clear political blocks, two clear economic blocks, you had two clear uh, military blocks within Europe itself. Okay, so that's the Cold War for you. Increasing tensions and of course, uh, look at this again, increasing competition, increasing tension and of course military and clear military and political alliances and blocks. Okay, so this was what we looked at just now. Okay, and finally uh, to end off, sorry I know it's a very very long um, lecture but it's a very uh, complicated topic but uh, basically it, you need to understand this part in order to put the Korean War, the Cuban Missile Crisis and of course the end of the Cold War into proper perspective. Okay, And finally we have the international expansion of the Cold War. Uh, it didn't just stay within Europe itself so far, we've been very very focused on Europe but it also expanded on a more international scale. So the Cold War spread to other countries. Uh, we looked at uh, how it spread to Korea. Okay, it later spread to um, Vietnam as well. So essentially, uh, there was a tremendous... Because the Soviet Union and the USA were the two most powerful countries in the world. So other countries uh, would uh, inevitably be affected and would feel the pressure and influence of these two very, very powerful countries. So there was an increasing pressure to align with either the Soviet Union or America, or with the Western allies. So it's an increasing pressure for countries to either become communist, become under communist influence or the Soviet influence, or under American Western allied influence. Okay, And uh, as a response, um, there was this thing called the Bandung Conference in 19... 55. Okay, basically it was uh, this year actually, as I speak now, it's 2015, that uh, we actually celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Bandung Conference this year. And Bandung was, is um, uh, basically a, a, a city in Indonesia. And uh, essentially there are 29 participating countries. Um, it was called by the newly independent Asian and African countries, okay, those which had recently been released from colonialism. And these countries, how, although there was a tremendous pressure to align across uh, the globe, they didn't want to be under American or Soviet influence. Okay, so they, they basically uh, started this thing called the non-aligned movement. So although there was a lot of pressure to be aligned to one of the two they decided to be neither, okay, and they opposed colonial uh, colonization, colonialism, and they uh, endeavored to improve economies through cooperation, without the influence of either the USA or the Soviet Union. So basically, they were the stubborn ones. All right. So um, yeah. So this is one of uh, the ways that uh, Cold War, the Cold War expanded out of Europe and into places like Asia and Africa. Okay, so this was a response to this expansion of the Cold War. And finally, I think most importantly, you need to take note of the Berlin Wall. Okay, so uh, we look at the Berlin Wall. Uh, essentially, okay, um, if we look at Berlin over here. Okay, within Berlin itself, 
Uh, what happened? Remember, uh, Stalin failed to get West Berlin absorbed into East Berlin. Okay, so what happened was that Berlin, being under the control of the Western Allies, continued to grow just like West Germany, and it grew at a faster rate, became more prosperous than its eastern part. Okay, so the, the prosperity in West Germany prompted those in East Germany to move. So during this time, there were a lot of people in East Germany moving over to the West simply because the West was more prosperous, the West had more opportunities than the East. And it was very, very embarrassing for um, the Soviet Union and for um, the communist part of Germany because uh, it looked like East Germany was economically weaker, economically less uh, capable than its Western part. It's very, very embarrassing for communism. Okay. And, um, of course, uh, JFK, who was uh, the American president, Kennedy, um, he refused to have USA depart from West Berlin. So although there were, there were still attempts for, from, um, for example, people like Khrushchev in the USSR to get uh, West Berlin absorbed into uh, East Berlin to form you know, one whole uh, communist-controlled uh, Berlin, uh, JFK uh, refused to have this done and basically he wanted a democratic West Berlin to stay there and uh, what happened was that because of uh, the refusal to absorb, to get West Berlin absorbed into the East in 1961 to prevent crossings from East Berlin into West Berlin <laughs> what happened was that a Berlin Wall was erected. Okay, all over, we see the perimeter of West Berlin was walled up, okay, in 1961, and <laughs> they actually began building uh, at night, okay, setting up uh, tempor temporary walls at night, so a lot of people were still sleeping when these uh, structures were being set up, so it, they will wake up the next morning. They find that they find themselves cooped up, you know, within uh, their own places, and so people from the east all over could not move into West Berlin. Okay, simply because they had been it had been walled up. Okay, and what happened was that this became a very clear symbol of the Cold War because. Uh, what what you see over here, okay, this very clear part, uh, under uh, Western democratic capitalist uh, system, was basically clearly separated from the communist system that surrounded it. So, very two very clear blocks, and these two very clear blocks seem to embody the two very clear blocks in Europe and also the two very clear blocks across the world, which uh, demonstrated the impact of the divisions. Of the Cold War, so the Berlin Wall for uh, about twenty five years or so after its uh, uh, building would serve as a very potent symbol of the Cold War. All right, so um, okay, I know it's a very very long chapter, um, a lot of information to absorb. Okay, uh, if it helps, okay, you should have uh, stopped you know, try to absorb whatever you could first and then carry on later on. But So we looked at the background summary. We also looked at the long-term ideological conflict. Uh, the events in World War II, which contributed to the increased uh, tensions in the post-war period. Uh, and also what the USA did, for example, the containment policy, how the Soviets uh, responded to the containment policy, which then contributed to increased tensions, which then led to the outbreak of the Cold War, and how the Cold War itself took shape, okay, in the form of the Berlin blockade, the militarization of the Cold War, and also the later international expansion of the Cold War. Alright, thank you.